Welcome to IMED's Radiology's Where Does It Hurt Musculoskeletal webinar series. I'm Angelique Grainbler, I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager for New South Wales ACT and WA. IMED Radiology is proud to present the first of our three-part muscular webinar series tonight, with tonight's session featuring our highly respected radiologist, Dr. Andrew Rothstein, who will focus the hour on diagnosing, managing lower back pain in general practice. Delivering the highest quality of expert care, having compassion and placing our patients at the centre of everything we do, as well as being innovative and adapting to change for the greater good of our patients and referrers are all important values for us here at IMED. Our online appointment booking system gives your patient the flexibility to make an appointment at any time of the day or night and our e-referral offering streamlines the referral process from your practice management software directly to our clinics and then brings the patient back into you again for review without the need for paper referrals or faxes. The patients enjoy the fact that they get a copy of the referral on their mobile phone, along with the link to make their appointment online. You can reach out to us for more information through the link on the resource page at the end of our webinar. Information on MSK and our next series of webinars can also be found on our IMED website education page under Insights. We are fortunate to have Dr. Damien Flanagan as our facilitator for this evening. Dr. Flanagan is a GP based in the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, where he's been practicing for the past 20 years. He's a keen interest in the natural environment and loves to get outdoors. His areas of special interest include, but are not limited to, chronic disease management, palliative care, and optimizing general health of the community. Before I hand over to Dr. Flanagan, I do have a few housekeeping items to mention. If you have any questions, please send those through during the presentation and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. At the conclusion of the webinar, please be sure to stay online to complete your evaluation form for your RACGP points. I will now hand over to Dr. Flanagan to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Angie, very much for, for that introduction. And thank you to IMED Radiology for putting on this great initiative. Where does it hurt? We know in, in general practice, you know, a great majority of our patients have um, musculoskeletal issues and to know how to better image that and get therapies for our patients is gonna be very interesting to see. Um, just again to reiterate a little bit on what Angie has said, um, there is some interactive opportunities for you audience out there. And if you want to ask some questions, please, uh, do that. You can see there is a question manager icon up the top, a little blue hand in a circle. You can press that and ask us a question. Now we've got 400 people online tonight, which is fantastic. So there might be a lot of questions. We have limited time for those questions, but we will get to them. There'll be two parts in the presentation where we'll pick some, some questions to ask to our speaker. One about halfway through, and then at the end of it as well, we'll have a question and answer session. So it's, it's, it's great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Andrew uh, Rothstein. Andrew is the Clinical Director of MRI, CT and Nuclear Medicine at Victoria House Medical Imaging in Victoria. He's got a very special interest in musculoskeletal um, radiology and is also an expert in radiology guided musculoskeletal and spinal injections. Andrew studied at Monash University, spent a little bit of time tutoring anatomy at um, Melbourne University, and then did a lot of his radiology training through Royal Melbourne Hospital. He's done some um, fellowships in various areas, and um, at the moment has a great interest in looking after athletes from AFL teams, from Cricket Australia and the Australian Open Tennis, as well as some other um, very important sporting um, codes. He um, also was the official radiologist for the Melbourne Commonwealth uh, Games, which is very topical at the moment with the Olympics going on. So I look forward to welcoming Andrew to give us this um, presentation. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay, thank you, Damien, for that introduction and uh, welcome to all of you across Australia, those of you who are still in lockdown, those of you that are free. Hopefully we can uh, entertain and educate you tonight. I'm Dr. Andrew Rothstein, and as uh, Damon discussed, I'm, I'm very uh, fortunate to work at a place called Victoria House Medical Imaging. We're a boutique musculoskeletal and spinal radiology clinic, part of the wider IMED network. 
And at the clinic, we, we get to deal with lots of patients, but um, we also have some special patients who come along, such as uh, Roger. And and we're, we're very sort of focused in trying to not only deliver um, standard care, but try to sort of push boundaries in, in radiology and what we, what we do. Um, so in tonight's lecture, I'm going to give you an overview of some of the different radiology modalities that are available to you and your patients. We're going to go through a series of case studies, which will illustrate some points for you, discuss the different injections that are available, and then move into a special niche area that we've worked a lot on in the sort of sporting field, which is past stress fractures. So not just dealing with, with middle-aged and elderly people who have uh, common problems with their spine, but also show you some of the things we're doing in younger, more athletic population. So as far as the radiology modalities available to you, obviously there's, there's lots of things. There's x-ray, MRI, CT, nuclear medicine. Um, and what I'll do is we'll get you guys working straight away in this presentation and I'll ask a question to you, I'll pose a question to you. So this is a question about radiation dose. So whenever you think about radiology, people think about radiation doses. So this is a bit of a curly question for you to start with. But what are the radiation doses for the following modalities for x-ray, CT and MRI. So you should be able to use the poll manager, hopefully, and answer this question as to what you think the radiation dose is in millisieverts. So millisieverts is our annual background radiation that we all get exposed to in the atmosphere. Um, and the annual background radiation is two. But what sort of dose do you think there would be from x-ray, CT and MRI? So option A is zero for x-ray, signal receiver to CT4 from MRI and so on and so forth. Hopefully you're able to access the poll manager and you can start answering the question that I have posed. So hopefully Stephen, who's our IT support, this is started. So out there, all of you watching, you need to try to answer this question. What do you think are the radiation doses of a lumbar spine, X-ray, CT, and MRI? Um, so yes, I'm starting to get, we've had quite a few responses, and I can see that, yes, most of you are very switched on, which is excellent. So the answer is C. So X-ray is three millisieverts, CT is 10 millisieverts, and MRI, there is no radiation at all. So here's a table which shows you the radiation doses. So two is the annual background, X-ray series is three. Bone scan, the dose is, is six, regardless of what sort of bone scan we do in the body because we're injecting the radiation into the patient. CT of the whole lumbar spine is 10, MRI is zero, and although we don't do ultrasound, ultrasound is zero. So an important differential here is that MRI has no radiation, CT has 10 millisieverts. If we talk about X-ray, so X-ray started many, like over 100 years ago, it gives us a great overview. We can use it in the, in the setting of trauma, We're looking for fractures or osteoporotic fractures, also gives us alignment, and we can also do functional views with flexion extension, the patient is wrecked, we can look for scoliosis. X-ray has an important role and a great overview. It's very quick and cheap and easily performed. Um, bone scan, we're looking at osteoblastic activity. So we inject the radioactive tracer into the patient. It's a sensitive test. We have what's called planar imaging, which is, which is, which is sort of like an X-ray where we get information back which produces this sort of image. Or we have spec CT where the detector removes around the patient and that data is then created into a sort of CT style image um, for the patient. Bone scan is very um, sensitive um, to, to pathology and it's good for looking for red flags and, and also tumour staging. But the problem with, with bone scan is we get no structural information. So it's a functional test, but it's not an anatomic test. And we need to go on and do a CT or an MRI to see what the activity is. So here you can see activity in the sort of posterior element. It's near where the facet joint is, the pedicle, the pars. We can see it on the planar imaging as well, but we don't know actually what's there. So is there a tumour? Is there um, arthritis? Is there a pars stress lesion? We don't know. So by using CT, CT SPECT, 
we can then fuse that information together. So now more modern nuclear medicine machines like the one we have at Victoria House have both a nuclear medicine detector and a CT detector built onto the one table. So the patient goes through the nuclear medicine component, we get that nuclear medicine information, then they go through the CT machine and then that information is fused together. So we can see in this patient due to the facet joint, we can also see a little bit of activity at the disc below. CT. Now, CT lumbar spine is done too much in, in Australia. Obviously, it's because GPs have a rebate and the patient can get a Medicare rebate for CT and for MRI. But in the ideal world, because of the radiation dose, 10 millisieverts, we shouldn't really be doing much CT. We should only really be using it for specific indications, for bony detail, assessing fractures in the setting of trauma, looking at follow-up of surgery uh, and healing of fractures and to guide interventional procedures because it has an advantage of um, knowing where our needle is. But ideally, we should not be using CT. 3T MRI, this is the MRI we have at Victoria House IMED. You can see it's a spacious room. We've got this nice um, skylight sort of facade so the patient does not feel claustrophobic. It's well lit. We've got caring staff with the patient. We have a very wide bore, which is short, so the patient does not feel claustrophobic. And MRI is the best one test. It provides a great overview of all structures. So unlike CT, MRI can actually see the spinal cord and can see what's happening inside the spinal cord substance. CT cannot do that. We can also see nerve roots. We can see the discs. We get excellent soft tissue contrast resolution, which is greater than that on CT. There's obviously no radiation, as I've already said. And the basic principles are that T2 this is a water sequence where the CSF is bright. You can see white CSF in front of the spinal cord. And on T1, it's, it's dark. Having said all that, MRI may not detect the site of the pain. So it gives us an anatomic information, but we still need to correlate that back with the clinical findings. As far as if you're ordering a patient for MRI, we talk about lines of defense. So the MRI is a very powerful magnet. So you guys are the first line of defense. On your referral pads, there are basic questions which enable you to screen for patients that may be contraindicated to MRI. Also, when the patient makes a booking, our reception staff will ask them for these contraindications. And also when they come on the day to have their scan, the MRI technologist will also ask those questions. If the patient does have a device or something implanted, usually they've been given information from the cardiologist or the surgeon, and that will have the make model serial number. We can then put that into a reference book and work out whether or not the patient is safe at MR, with MRI and also at different MRI strengths. So there are some uh, devices which are safe at 1.5 Tesla, but would not be safe at 3T. So the patient could go to another IMED MRI with a lower field strength. Another general point for you to be aware of is that once a patient has had orthopedic fixation for six weeks, that's incorporated into the bone and then they're safe to have an MRI. So if they've got a total hip joint replacement and it's after six weeks we're doing an MRI of their brain, they're fine to have the MRI. Here's another question for you. So question two, same sort of process. The MRI scanner's powerful magnetic field is only activated for each sequence, is only active during clinical operation hours, is always active, is only active if the electricity bills have been paid. So we'll get you guys start um, answering that quiz. Um, hopefully that's coming through. Okay, so... Some people are saying it's only activated for each scan and sequence. Um, that's 53% and 45% are saying it's always active. And that's increasing. So people are saying it's only activated for each scan, each sequence. Well, in reality, the MRI is on always. It's always on. So the answer is C, it's always active. That's a bit of a misunderstanding that some people people have. Like obviously, if you're having a CT scan, then we only we only image when when that uh, part of your anatomy is in is in the uh, gantry. But with MRI, the the magnet is always on, and and it takes a lot of energy and power to keep it going. 
And this is an example showing that the MRI is always on. So this was in America, an overzealous orderly wheeled the patient in to have the scan of the patient's brain. And you can see the power of the magnet was able to suck in the whole trolley with the patient on board. And the patient then needed to have an MRI of their cervical spine as well because of whiplash. So we then take MRI safety very seriously. The contraindications include um, metal that is inside the patient, so aneurysm clip or shrapnel which may move or be heated in a delicate location. And then there are also electronic devices which will be ruined by the magnetic field. Uh, as you can see here, there are some pacemakers now that have MRI safe mode and that can be adjusted and the patient can go to a hospital site and have that done. But generally speaking, um, electronic devices, even in your mobile phone, for example, will be ruined by the magnetic field. So I've touched on some of the modalities. Now we'll go into some cases. So case one, 45 year old, bilateral leg pain for three months, conservative treatment, um, you've tried all the conservative things, so physiotherapy, uh, patient's weight, other sort of um, analgesics, anti-inflammatories, but the patient's got ongoing pain and asks for help. So the patient went on and had a CT scan. Now the, the title to this slide says large disc extrusion. And you may look at it and say, well, where is the disc extrusion, Andrew? I'm having trouble seeing it. And this is the challenge with CT. The, the, the contrast difference between the CSF and the disc is difficult to appreciate. Here's comparing MRI with CT. So now you can now the disc extrusion is much more obvious. Okay, and and that's the power of MRI, this, this ability to differentiate CSF um, from disc and to actually see the nerve roots. You can see in the bottom right hand image those little dots. They're the nerve roots at each level, and you can also see the nerve root exiting at that level. Here's a reformat. So on CT, we've taken the data and made a sagittal image. While with MRI, we have to do a sagittal uh, T2 and T1 sequence. But you can see this large disc extrusion coming from the L4-5 level. Um, disc lesions can also occur in young people. Here's an example of a 13-year-old gymnast um, who's got a left um, postrolateral L5 S1 disc protrusion compressing the left S1 nerve. So how prevalent are disc lesions? Well, we know that they're very common. So asymptomatic patients, this is a great, um, when MRI first came, came around in 1994, it's, a, it's an old paper, but you can see asymptomatic patients will have disc lesions. Um, and symptomatic patients um, with radiculopathy or lower back pain, the, the, the prevalence is increased, but we don't always see the disc lesion as, as well. So one of the aims of MRI is really to differentiate acute lesions from chronic lesions. And we're able to do that by the signal characteristics of the lesion. So with any pathology, be it a tumour, infection, inflammation, we see edema. So we get right T2 signal and dark T1 signal. And with an acute lesion, the disc is T2 bright and ill-defined. And when it becomes chronic, it becomes darker and more well-defined. So this is axial T2 images. We've, we can see the red arrow there. You can see on the patient's left side, there's a disc extrusion, which is ill-defined. It's hyper intense and it's compressing the nerve. On the right side, you can see the nerve exiting the foramen. On the left side, you can see the nerve being pushed back posteriorly by the disc extrusion. Now look how it's ill-defined and hyper intense. Here's some sagittal images again. Um, the blue, the blue arrows show the normal nerve root exiting and surrounded by fat on both T1 and T2. And the level above the red arrows show the disc extrusion displacing and compressing the exiting nerve. Now, if we compare those images to a chronic disc extrusion, you can now see that the disc extrusion shown with the red arrow is more sharply defined. You could draw a pencil line around it and it's also black. So all the inflammation, the edema is gone. So this is a chronic lesion. So it may cause symptoms, but it's less likely to be the symptomatic lesion. The, the acute lesion, which you've already seen on the previous slide, that's the lesion, the disc lesion that's going to be causing trouble. And that's how MRI can differentiate those pathologies. We can also see in chronic uh, chronic disc lesions, so on the right side, you can see there's a little annular fissure and a disc protrusion. Uh, impacting on that exiting right L5 nerve, you can see change in the muscles. So the multifidus muscle on the right side there, we've got a neuropathy. So the nerve um, supplying that muscle is affected and the nerve is atrophying 
and it's also become a little bit um, hyper, in hyper intense. What's the natural history of a disc lesion if we do nothing at all? So MODEC, who, who the end plate changes are named after, serial MRIs in a lot of patients, and you can see the disc lesions resolve. So if we do nothing, we know that disc lesions will go away with time and hopefully the patient's symptoms as well. So even though the initial MRI may show a large lesion, which is of concern to the patient and the referrer, um, we shouldn't be too, too concerned. And large disc lesions actually seem to, to more dramatically reduce in size. And, and what I'm, the point I'm sort of leading to here is that surgery should really be based clinically. So although we've got a very powerful tool in MRI, we can see lesions, we still have to base surgery on the clinical findings and not on the radiology. So here's a patient who had a large um, disc extrusion and had conservative management. And two years later, you can see on the subsequent uh, sagittal image that the disc extrusion has resolved. Here's the same patient, axial image, large disc extrusion. You can see the CSF is being effaced, compressed, the nerve roots being displaced. Conservative management, the disc has shrunk back down. So just because there's a big disc lesion doesn't mean your patient needs to go straight to have surgery. Treat every patient on their own merits clinically. Here's a uh, left L45, um, left paracentral disc protrusion. You can see it's hyper intense and you can see the nerve is being compressed, left L5 nerve. Now what we would do radiologically for this um, if the patient is not responding, if the, firstly, does the patient have L5 nerve root symptoms and if the patient is not benefiting from a trial of conservative treatment, um, we would do a left L5 nerve root sleeve injection. So this is done with the patient prone on the CT table. Um, you can see that the white line coming in on the left of your image is the needle and then we put the needle right next to the nerve, which is outlined by fat there, and then we inject um, anesthetic and cortisone along the nerve and that reduces inflammation around the nerve and also tracks back up via the epidural space to where that disc um, protrusion extrusion is. Here's another case, this is the far lateral disc extrusion. So this is an important one because this can sometimes be missed um, on CT or by radiologists who aren't quite on the ball because these, these are far lateral. So most radiologists, when we're looking at images and even surgeons, concentrate on what's happening inside the spinal canal where the blue arrow is. We're looking at the nerve roots, we're looking at the margin of the disc, but these extrusions are far lateral. So they're outside the spinal canal, but they're still impacting on the exiting nerve and um, these, these can be missed, so an important lesion to consider. Clinically, these patients will be lumbar quadrant test positive. Um, the management should be no extension exercises. They can be often surgically treated as a canal stenosis, so have a laminectomy and a microdiscectomy, but really uh, these, these lesions can be missed. We still treat this as a foraminal injection, um, similar to what I showed you before. So we, we come in with the, with the needle um, and, we, and we inject adjacent to the nerve. I'll move, not all lesions are, are disc lesions, and um, we do see what's called facet joint cysts. So yes, 95% of, or 98% are due to disc lesions, but there are also what are called the facet joints in, in your spine, and from those joints, people can get a ganglion. Now the ganglion or cyst can be extraspinal, and we don't worry about that, but if it's intraspinal, as you can see where, this green, where the green arrows are, it can produce mass effect inside the spinal canal, the bony spinal canal, and it can compress the surrounding nerves. Um, it can be difficult to appreciate on CT because again, the contrast resolution between um, the CSF and the cyst can be difficult to appreciate on a CT, but on MRI, it's much more obvious. We do require MRI, as I said. Clinically, these patients often will, will present in a weird way. They'll have pain standing rather than sitting. Obviously, when patients are sitting, there's increased uh, pressure on the discs, as they, there was a study done on medical students that proved that. Um, so, so the clinical presentation can be, can be a bit strange. How do we manage that? So what, what I do is do a CT-guided facet joint aspiration. So put a needle into the facet joint and aspirate fluid from the joint and hopefully from the ganglion cyst and put in some cortisone, but, but a low volume cortisone with no anesthetic to reduce inflammation that's producing the cyst and also inject the nerve that's being compressed by the cyst. 
small. So here's a patient, sagittal MRI and axial MRI. You can see the cyst here inside the spinal canal. Um, subsequently had a CT aspiration injection. So the patient again is prone. We put in, uh, we wash the skin with antiseptic, put in local anesthetic, then we put a spinal needle inside the spinal canal. Sorry, correct, inside the facet joint. We aspirate the, the joint and the cyst fluid back, put in a bit of cortisone in, and then we inject the nerve root. And this patient had great clinical improvement. So no surgery, and you can see MRI five months after injection. Um, the cyst has gone radiologically. They had the MRI because the surgeon still wanted to check, but there was great improvement. I'm going to clear my throat, but I might throw to Damien, who might just look at some of the questions at this stage. <coughs> Thank you, Angie. Yes, we have got a, a, a couple of questions. I've got two that I'm going to pick, Andrew. Um, one of them is a very practical one. Um, bone scans, are they Medicare rebatable? Uh, yes, they are. So, so GPs, um, they are Medicare rebatable. Um, um, there will be a, a gap, um, but gap is often less than the out-of-pocket expense um, from, or, or similar to the out-of-pocket expense from MRI. It depends a bit where you are. Uh, yes, they are Medicare rebatable for GPs. And, and, and the, the second question, Andrew, and final question is, there's a variety of recommendations that we receive as GPs after the radiologists do injections into either the spinal canal or into facet joints. What's the normal time frame to commence physiotherapy after an injection? Okay, I'll go back one step just to the bone scan question. The use of bone scan in this in lumbar spine area is really to work out which facet joint is osteoblastically active. So say you've got a patient who's got lots of degenerative change through multiple facet joints, we're not sure which joint to inject. If we do the bone scan in the specs and we show one particular joint is hot, like that image that I showed in my talk, then we would know, let's just inject as the second question that you asked. So when I perform these injections, I tell the patient um, keep their activity to a minimum for the next week. We also give patients a pain chart um, to record their response to the injection, particularly the local anaesthetic. So that, that's of particular importance because the cortisone can have a, have a sort of localised effect across multiple levels. The cortisone effect or the celestone we use can take, usually takes effect within two or three days, but can take up to two weeks to get a response. Um, and then I would resume physio after, say, a week's time. I, I wouldn't do swimming. I wouldn't do any lower limb. I wouldn't do any upper limb. I'd say to them, don't play golf. Just one week's not a long time, given that you've gone through this whole process of having the injection. And I would resume your activities very gradually. Some patients are very keen. Oh, great. I can go play golf in a week's time. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Just got to take it very slowly and build back up. Also, the advantage of the injections is it takes away the pain. And so their physio and the, the activity of their muscles uh, is better when there's no pain. So, so that's sort of the other purpose of these injections. So they're partly diagnostic, but also therapeutic. If we keep moving and segue into injections, I'll show you some of the injections that we do. So some are for facet joint arthropathy. This can be a very common cause of lower back pain. Um, it's important to educate the patient about why it's occurring, so the rotational and flexion component movements. Um, so avoid those, those movements. Um, use exercise and non-steroidals. Try to avoid manipulation if possible. CT guide injection uh, can be done for the diagnostic and therapeutic that we've talked about, and surgical fusion is very rare. So to do the injection, um, as I've said, the patient's prone, antiseptic, local anaesthetic, spinal needle into the joint, and then we inject the, the agent into the joint. Um, there are other injections we do, so trans, trans laminar epidural, so this is going between the lamina at two levels, going in between, um, and, we, and we reserve that for usually canal stenosis when there's bilateral leg symptoms, so, and, 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 or multi-level canal stenosis, it can also be done um, post-operatively. The other injection is doing a nerve root sleeve injection. It's also got another name called transforaminal epidural, which I think complicates things because then 
Uh, there can be confusion amongst patients, reception staff, technical staff as to are we doing a translaminar epidural or a transforaminal epidural. So I tend to use just nerve root sleeve injection and that should be reserved for unilateral symptoms. So if the patient's got bilateral, do a epidural because it will spread to both sides and multi-levels versus if they've got a focal disc and a unilateral sciatica, do the nerve root sleeve injection. Facet joints, as we've said, we can do that bilateral or multi-level, but best if it's sort of a stage procedure. We can also inject the facet joint and sacroiliac joints. Some of the theories behind these injections is obviously it comes back to good medicine. So the history, the examination, trying conservative management, if that fails, then going to imaging. Um, you may be pressured by patients to do imaging, but try to take it one step at a time. And that the clinical features in radiology must match up for the interventional target. So I tend to say, if the obviously using what I've told you about, which is the acute disc lesion on MRI versus the chronic disc lesion, and then saying if the patient has left L5 radiculopathy and is not benefiting conservative treatment options, then CT but left L5 nervous leave injection could be performed. So I try to sort of give you guys some wiggle room so that so the report doesn't the patient doesn't read the report and say I've got to have this procedure. Uh, done, but it's also sort of garbage in, garbage out. So it's important on your referral that you try to say which side is the radiculopathy on, which dermatome you think it is, to try to help us. Because obviously, as I've shown you, we're going to find MRI is very sensitive. We're going to find multi-level and bilateral findings. We want to we want to sort of give the best possible report, treat the patient, not the radiology. Choose one level for the procedure. Don't say I want three-level nerve roots or, or six facets injected or back pain, please inject. So we, we sometimes see these referrals and it's not really a good medicine. Um, so the epidural or the interlaminar epidural steroid injection. So you can see here, I put the needle down and then we inject air, which, which outlines the epidural space, the fecal space um, where the CSF is outlined by the gas, you can see it going onto both sides. So that's an, an interlaminar epidural. Sometimes I do a caudal epidural. This is when we're trying to maybe come from below rather than from above the canal stenosis, and we put in a large volume. I still use the CT machine and put a needle in through the sacral hiatus, and you can see the white contrast going above the needle there outlining the caudal epidural space. The nerve root sleeve injection or nerve root sheath injection or the transforaminal epidural steroid injection, which I've already shown you, similar sort of uh, procedure as, as well. Sometimes it can be a little bit challenging to get between the bones to get down to the, to the nerve, but we always sort of manage to find a way. Um, I would recommend if the patient has got a, a far lateral protrusion or even a paracentral protrusion, probably trying the nerve root sleeve injection first it's less invasive, there's slightly less risks, and if the patient doesn't benefit, then go on and do the, the um, interlaminar epidural if they've got a unilateral sciatica. With the epidural, we keep our patients for two hours on the trolley. All patients who, ha who have these injections should have a driver. They can't drive home because of the anaesthetic um, and because we don't want them to have a car accident, uh, obviously. If we move on to case five, the red flag, so is a patient, 60-year-old, previous history of breast cancer, surgery, new onset of lower back pain. So we would still start with an X-ray. X-ray gives a good overview uh, for, for red flag screening. Um, and if you look closely, those of you who are looking very closely, you can see abnormality here of the left-sided pedicle at um, L5, L1, sorry, so the left pedicle. If you look at the level above, the pedicles are sort of end on and the cortex and the marrow should be preserved. But on the left side here, we're getting destruction of an expansion of the pedicle and also of the inferior end plate. So what other tests are available? So bone scan. Bone scan would be used to stage the patient. So are there any other bone lesions about. So we can see the increased uptake within the L1 vertebral body, but we can also see uptake up in the rib on the patient's left side. So you can see high up there, there's a single rib area of rib activity. So that's not good, multiple lesions. CT, CT is used for staging. So CT is not used to assess the lumbar spine in this case. CT is look to look to see is there liver metastases? Are there lymph nodes elsewhere? 
um, adrenal lesions, lung lesions. So CT, we would do CT, say, chest, abdomen, pelvis, or if they've got any brain symptoms, you might do CT brain as well. But CT, staging, and bone scans for stage. Spinal cord compression is, is where MRI comes in. So here's the same lesion again. MRI is best able to show the spinal cord is the metastasis encroaching on the spinal cord substance? Is there spinal cord edema? What is occurring there? So red flag cases, things to think about in your history is the patient's age, past history of cancer, night pain, pain that's not mechanical, um, any fever or recent infection, significant trauma, drug dependence, immunosuppression, any um, quarter of quina bowel and bladder symptoms or neurological deficits. So think about the red flags. It's not all discs. Other pathologies, sacroiliitis or sacroiliac arthropathy, it's often not thought of, maybe a bit undiagnosed, um, can be secondary to trauma, OA. Pregnancy also alters the sacroiliac joints. Um, if we've got uh, leg leg discrepancy or pain in a hip joint, that can then refer pain to the sacroiliac joint on the same side or the other side um, for patients who have had, uh, who have got the arthropathies, so sacroiliitis, the seronegatives. Um, symptoms, so lower back, groin pain can be aggravated by standing rather than sitting, so, so that's diff different discs, walking, going upstairs and other activities. So here's an MRI, you can see um, erosions on both sides of the joint, bone marrow edema. Um, X-ray is still done, it's still the mainstay, and there's also, um, it's used for, in, rheumat in rheumatology, there are the anti-TNF inhibitors, and there's what's called the New York uh, grading criteria. So to qualify to get those medications, the patient needs to have bilateral grade two or unilateral grade three. So X-ray is still the sort of gold standard, but MRI, I think, is more sensitive. Spec CT, nuclear medicine can also be performed, and we do do sacroiliac joint injections. So the treatment of sacroiliac arthropathy, again, um, the, the standard sort of anti-inflammatories and rest, physiotherapy, strengthening. Um, patient may have a leg length discrepancy, so that's something to consider and CT guided injection. So similar to doing a facet joint injection, here you can see um, same thing, same principle. We put the needle into the sacroiliac joint and inject it into there with the cortisone and anesthetic. Okay, case seven. So you may see some of these patients. We live in Australia, the Olympics is on. Everyone thinks their, their daughter or son is gonna be the next superstar. So you've got this talented junior doing basketball and cricket five times a week, presenting with lower left back pain, worse with extension, what is your differential diagnosis? So we'll go to the pole manager again. So this facet joint arthropathy, is this a past stress fracture? Is this going to be a disc protrusion or is this an osteoid osteoma? Um, so, okay, so everyone's concentrating and everyone said past stress so you're all clued into that. Um, and, and I suppose imaging a past stress fracture is an area of interest of ours um, at Victoria House Medical Imaging. Uh, and it also shows sort of how radiology has evolved over the last probably 30 years. So here's an MRI with bone marrow edema. So, so with any stress lesion on, it, on MRI, we see bone marrow edema. Um, if you compare the level above, so we've got sequences which, which can look for just for edema. You can also see the fracture on a CT. So vertebral anatomy, the pars in Latin is the bridge, and it's sort of the junction point between the anterior uh, elements and the posterior elements. And there's a lot of stress and rotational force goes through the pars. We commonly see it in um, adolescents, people very active and in all the sort of sports which we commonly see around in Australia. Um, it's a fatigue fracture. The greatest load is happening at L5-S1 um, and therefore the distribution is most common at L5. So you can see this is the distribution of past stress fractures. But as this MRI is shown here, we do see them higher up as well. So there's a, there's a past stress lesion at the L2 level. We have definitions. So really, we can divide these lesions into acute lesions, 
um, such as a stress reaction or an incomplete fracture. And these are the ones we want to try to catch. These are the ones where we can make a difference, which will heal with an extended period of rest. There also are the chronic lesions, the complete fractures, the non-unions, they're not going to heal. And our management differs for these different types of lesions. Using the radiology, we can, we can grade the lesions as well. So if you think about lumbar vertebra as a bit of a circle, you've got the vertebral body in front, you've got the pedicle and the pars on either side, and then you've got the lamina at the back. So if we've got an incomplete fracture, that's going to do better than a complete fracture. If we've got a fracture on one side, so unilateral, that's going to do better than fractures on both sides. If the fracture goes through the posterior lamina, it's going to do worse, so the ring's broken at multiple points, it's going to be harder for the ring to heal. If the ring's only broken at one point, it can heal. Also, there are patients which have spina bifida or occultus, so developmental failure of fusion of the lamina, and they're less likely to heal as well. So when there's a complete fracture, they're more likely to go on to get non-union and then to get complications, such as a spondylolisthesis, so the slip forward. And that can then be associated with disc degeneration, and compression of the nerve exiting. So here's a CT with soft tissue and bony reformats. And you can see there's two levels. So at L5 and at L4, there are PARS defects, which are now chronic. You can see slip forward. You can see the nerve being compressed as it's trying to exit. And you can see degenerative change in the disc at that level. So, so for the, the management's very important. If we get a past stress reaction, an incomplete fracture, we try to heal the lesion. We try to rest the lesion. So it's almost like an ACL injury in some of these elect cricketers. And also even in young adolescents who are trying to do sport, they just get these recurrent episodes of back pain. They can't do their sport. So, so really, if we can pick them up and give them a prolonged period of rest, the bone actually heals and strengthens and they're not going to go on and get these complications later in life. Versus once the horse is bolted, well, it's more a six-week period of rest as symptomatic relief. So here's a patient with chronic um, bilateral pars defects where I've injected, put the needle down to the defect and injected cortisone and anaesthetic to try to settle things down. But it's not going to heal. So question four, what's the best test for detection and grading of a pars stress lesion? So you're all good an opportunity for me to have a quick drink, but you're all um, going now into this quiz. And we're getting different um, results. So 50% of people are saying CT, 40% um, are saying nuclear medicine. 13% are saying X-ray and only 8% are saying MRI. So what I'm going to try to do now is show you why MRI is actually the best one test to detect and grade a PARS stress lesion. So firstly, if we go back to our radi radiation table, okay, we're dealing with young people. The radiation dose for an MRI is zero. Radiation dose from CT is 10. So five times annual background radiation with a CT. Now, some sites will limit the CT just the level, but unfortunately, some sites um, across Australia are still doing CT of the whole lumbar spine in a 16-year-old, in a which, is, which is not good medicine. Bone scan, six millisieverts, it will show activity, but we still need to go on and do the CT or do another test to try to grade the lesion. X-ray, it was our mainstay, so you may remember from your medical school days this thought, talk of the Scotty dog, the collar around the Scotty dog being broken, where the PARS is. And that's true. It's good at showing defects and chronic complete fractures, but we're going to miss those acute PARS stress lesions, the stress reactions, the acute incomplete fractures, where we know if we give the patient a period of rest, we can actually make a difference. Those are going to be a cult on X-ray. We're not going to find them. Bone scan, yes, it's going to be sensitive. Yes, we're going to see activity, but we're going to expose the patient to radiation. We're still going to need to give them CT 
scan. CT was our gold standard. It's very good at showing the fractures. So here are, here are some sagittal reef formats. The fractures usually always arise at this inferior pedicle pars junction and track up superiorly. These are different patients. And we, and we can use CT to assess whether or not it's, it's healing. And, and I know some of you are thinking, well, maybe um, these modalities are all rebatable. I get the Medicare rebate for my patient. Um, but um, I'll come to that answer as well. Um, the disadvantages of CT is that a past stress reaction will be negative. So on CT, we won't see a stress reaction, but it will be positive on bone scan, will be positive on MRI. And then I've, talked, I've spoken already about the radiation dose. So MRI is actually the best test. Okay, it's a great screening and diagnostic test. There's no radiation. For GPs, there are, there is, there are Medicare rebates available. Now, um, if the patient's under the age of 16 at the time of scan and they've had an X-ray, so what we do is just one lateral X-ray to look at the alignment, to look to see if they slip, then they qualify under the GP re rebate using that code to have a rebatable MRI. It's similar to MRI of the knee for under 16s as well. If they're over the age of 16, I would still recommend doing the MRI. And, and I'll show you what we've done. So these are special sequences that we run. It's not as, as stand sagittal T1 and T2s. We have two sequences. One is looking for bone marrow edema, so what's called STIR. We run that routinely on, on, on our MRI at Victoria House Medical Imaging and across most of the MRI sites within IMED Victoria. And this is very sensitive for the stress reaction. And in, in older patients, it can show facet joint arthropathy. It could also show end plate edema from a discitis. So this is a standard sequence STIR. Then we developed another sequence called T1 fat stat vibe. And this is like the CT, this is the morphology. So one's looking for the activity, the stir looks for the activity, the vibe looks for the fracture morphology. And so it's a past stretch fracture specific protocol, 3T MRI, we use our special sequences, special uh, parameters. And we're also able to invert the vibe to make it look like a CT. So there were some clinicians who, who were used to looking at CT. We can take that middle image and invert the data to make it look like CT. So effectively, they're getting a CT with an MRI. What did we do? So at, our, at Victoria House, we, we do a lot of research as well. So we set out to prove or to, to assess was MRI equal to CT in detecting past stress fractures. So. So we went back in 2016 amongst um, the other radiologists, Dr. O'Shea and Dr. Robert, who will be speaking to you about knee and uh, shoulder in this series in the next few weeks. They were involved in our fellow, and we, we looked at patients who had had both a CT and MRI. We were blinded to the findings, and we showed that MRI was with that, the VIBE sequence was just as accurate as the CT, and therefore there was no need to have the CT or nuclear medicine to show the past stress fractures. Cricket Australia were interested in what we'd done and they approached us and said, look, we've got a major problem. We're losing a lot of our fast bowlers to these past stress reactions, past stress fractures, and all of our juniors coming up. It's like an ACL injury. They're out for a long period of time. We need to work out what's going on here. So they were interested in the bone marrow edema. So what we did was we, you can see the image here showing the bone marrow edema in the past, that white area. We measured that area. We measured the intensity of that bone marrow edema and we compared it to the bone marrow, bone marrow intensity in the vertebral body to produce a ratio. So it's hard to see the numbers there, but it's approximately 260 over 60, so the ratio would be 4 to 1. So we're able to show that ratio. We also looked at how far the bone marrow edema was spreading the extent, and we showed good um, that it was a reliable and valid measure. So we did intra and intra observer. Um, um, correlation between myself and the fellow James Stegman and we showed that this was a reliable measure that we could undertake. Then the Cricket Australia said okay we've got all these junior bowlers all across Australia we want to try to predict the ones that we're going to get stress fractures. So across multiple sites across Australia they were having MRIs we were blinded to what was happening clinically to these patients and we recorded what the intensity ratio was of the bone marrow edema to the vertebral body, 
and, and the extent of the bone marrow edema, and we and we and they were followed up to see how many of these developed stress fractures. So what what was shown is that is that they looked we looked at the bone marrow edema ratio. What was the likelihood that these patients would go on and get a stress fracture 12 weeks after the MRI? So when the ratio was low, so the PARS edema to vertebral body ratio was roughly um, was low. They were, you can see the no stress fracture group, it was very low, versus once it started getting up above two to three to four, they were highly likely to give it, develop a stress fracture. And where this is leading is, can we sort of stop them early before they get the fracture by picking up the bone marrow edema? Also, the extent of the bone marrow edema, so how far it was spreading in the pedicle, the pars, the lamina, the transverse process, the more that it extent, the, the wider the extent, the more likely they were going to get, get stress fractures. And this is shown out in these tables. So we showed with the intensity, the ratio, that there was great agreement. And that as the ratio, if you look in the bottom left table, where it's got bone marrow edema ratio to probability of stress fracture, as the ratio increases, as the intensity in the pars and the pedicle goes up relative to the vertebral body to three, to four, to five, to six, they were going to get a fracture also as the volume increased. So Cricket Australia started using this data to, to and looked at how many de deliveries these players were bowling um, and, and were better able to reduce the prevalence and incidence of these stress fractures. We also used the MRI to, to follow up the fractures to show that there's healing. So um, document the healing. Um, look at the size of the fracture and the bone marrow edema on the initial MRI. So the greater the fracture size was and the greater the intensity corresponded to the number of days it took to heal. So you can see here, this is serial MRIs. They look like CTs, but they're just inverted biopsies. So here's the acute fracture on the left side. You can see the fracture line going up. And then three months later, the fracture is becoming more indistinct. It's becoming smaller. And then at six months, it's healed. So rather than doing CT scans to follow these patients up, using MRI without radiation, we're able to show that the fractures heal. Tennis Australia have also been interested in our work and, and particularly um, documenting the findings in their junior players, um, but also looking at the angle of the facet joint. So if the facet joint angle is greater, you can see that picture there with the red arrows, if the angle is greater and the facet joints are more coronally orientated, so, so if you imagine that angle became a right angle, well then what's happening is the superior and inferior articular pillar, oh anyway, I can't use a mouse on this, but basically the forces here are then going through the pars versus if they've got a smaller angle, they've got more rotation, more movement, less force through the pars, they were less likely to get fractures. So, so the MRI can also give it prognostic information. Pat Raft, who was not involved in the study, he was just uh, visiting one day. Um, so overall, in summary, um, I've tried to take you on a quick tour through all the radiology modalities available to you. X-ray is still a mainstay. It should not be forgotten despite the um, exciting MRI. It still gives a great overview. It's a good screen for red flags, for trauma, very functional as well, looking at scoliosis. Uh, and, and slips. MRI, I think we need to get a, a sort of shift, and, and this is partly obviously due to Medicare rebates and, and the government and, and, and Department of Health, but MRI is really the best test. Okay, It gives so much more information and there's no radiation. CT, we should really just reserve for specific bony questions or to guide intervention. Nuclear medicine bone scan is good for staging or looking for an active joint. But again, it does. Uh, there is radiation. Why should you be imaging? I think just because the patient's got back pain, you've got to be aware on MRI. We're going to find lots of findings. We really need to be imaging um, if there's specific neurology, um, such as radiculopathy or myelopathy, um, and, and that there's also the indication of past stress fractures, which is particularly in interest of ours. And then to guide it. In, Injections, we now use CT just because it's more targeted, gives us more information. That's the end of my presentation. So I might throw back to uh, Damien now um, to sum up and maybe run the question and answer session for us. Thank you, Damien.
Thank you, Andrew. There is uh, lots of questions. We had um, over 500 p uh, participants watching this presentation, so you can imagine there's quite a lot of questions. One of the first questions I can answer is that, is this being videoed and can you look at this presentation at a later date? The answer to that is yes, you can. So those of you who want to do that are able to, and I know some of you had difficulty logging in and getting adequate, um, adequate reception. So yes, you can look at it later. Um, if I look at the questions, there's a lot of them in, relate, in relation to the first part of the presentation and a lot related to the, uh, the facet joint um, issues and the PARS issues. So I might start with what we had in the first part of the presentation. So a lot of GPs are asking um, questions around um, the issue with regards to the different types of injections, Andrew, and I know you've discussed that there are sleeve injections, there are epidural in, in injections, but are sleeve injections and nerve root injections the same thing? Yes, yes. So so I've covered a lot of information, but yeah. So a, so a nerve root sleeve injection, a nerve root sheath injection, a nerve root injection, a transforaminal epidural injection, they're all doing the same thing. They're all targeting the nerve root inside the, the frame and as it's exiting. So they're all the same thing. So nerve root, nerve root sleeve, nerve root sheath, transforaminal epidural are all the same injection. And I would reserve them more for a focal disc protrusion or a foraminal stenosis, a narrowing where the nerve's coming out and, and the patient has radiculopathy on one side, um, it's a very targeted injection to a particular level. Now, what, which the side should be easy because the patient should know and the clinician, everyone knows which side. As far as which level to do, that requires sort of, I suppose, the clinical history, the examination findings and the radiology and all those need to sort of line up together. I, tr I tried to show you that, that Obviously, with MRI, we can pick what's an acute disc because we'll show the inflammatory changes ill-defined versus an, a more defined chronic lesion. Um, but it, it, and it's, it's a teamwork, I suppose, between the clinician, the patient, and the radiologist to make sure we're doing the, the correct level. We also give the patient a pain chart to see what their response is. But that's 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 one type of injection. The second type of injection is, it's like, again, multiple names, but an epidural injection, an interlaminar epidural injection, that means we're going between two laminae. Um, that should be more reserved for either patients with, who are more usually more elderly, have got canal stenosis due to the disc bulging facet joint arthropathy, the, the, the canal is narrowed, and that's more a broader treatment. They may have multi-level canal stenoses, they'll have bilateral radiculopathy, um, they may have had a previous um, laminectomy, microdiscectomy at another level. So that's the other style of injection. And that, and that injection, there is slightly more risk um, because if the needle goes too deep, we can puncture the CSF space and the CSF can leak out and then they can get a headache. Having said that, it's uh, maybe one happened in 20 years. So it's not a, not a common thing. We also have the patient resting on a table with our nurse for two hours after. Um, there's also a small risk of an epidural hematoma. I've, I've never seen that happen. Um, and any series of CSF leak, it can be treated with what's called a blood patch, where we inject blood into the epidural space at that level to create a little clot over, over the area. But the patient, if it happens, would get a headache and sort of photophobia due to um, CSF leak. But again, very unlikely to happen. Um, but And the, the other indication for those epidurals is if the patient has radiculopathy hasn't benefited from the nerve root injection, and now we're going to come from the other side. So if you imagine when we're doing the foraminal injection, we're coming outside the spinal canal, the injectate maybe hasn't been able to get through and past the block. So let's come from the other side, inside the spinal canal, to come the other side to try to treat it. That would be the, the use of the epidural injection. Andrew, um, Lisa Payne's asked a very practical question. Uh, question. Um, often when we order these injections, we're trying to reduce the swelling and inflammation. But what if we've got a lot of facet joint um, hypertrophy? Is that bony impingement or degeneration going to benefit from a, an injection? 
Yeah. I, um, okay. So I'll, I'll try to add, like, if the patient's got, so the, the injections are not going to take away bone. They're not, it's, it's obviously not a surgery. All the injection, the, the um, celestone is doing is reducing inflammation in the area. So the soft tissue is swelling in, in the area. Um, if the patient's got a spinal canal stenosis, injecting the facet joints is unlikely to benefit them. The only case would be if there was a facet joint cyst inside the spinal canal, injecting the facet joint could shrink the cyst down. As far as for facet joint arthropathy, I think there's benefit in injecting the fa Like, if they tried the other treatments, injecting the facet joint with Celesto in the hope that helps the patient improve. I do have patients who come back every two years or every 18 months and they feel like their symptoms are coming back and then I just inject the facet joint again. Um, there are other injections or other procedures called radiofrequency ablation where the nerve that supplies the facet joint is de-innovated. It's a bit more invasive. It involves sort of cooking the area um, and those um, the nerve can grow back. So that's not a, not a sort of panacea treatment either, um, but that's another procedure that people may hear about. And another practical question, the GPs that are watching this are from all around Australia and uh, they've got lots of different radiology pr practices that they might refer to. So the question is, do radiologists, do all radiologists do these type of procedures? And do we know, how do we know if the services are available uh, locally in the country? Yes, uh, good question. Um, look, not all ra radiologists, like all GPs are different, we all have our pet areas. So not every radiologist is an interventional radiologist. And, and um, yeah, I, 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 so some radiologists do, some radiologists don't. As far as knowing whether your local radiologist does, um, it's probably best, maybe this is something that IMED nationally can sort of let you know as to who the local interventional radiologist is in your local area or even just ring up the clinic and and um, speak to the radiologist. We're lucky at Victoria House, we've got, we're known and we've got three or four doctors there, but maybe even, and we like to sort of speak to the clinicians because it's sort of good to work together, but maybe to try to develop a relationship with your local IMED radiologist and see what they can do, or maybe that maybe there are certain doctors who come on different days who like to do procedures. I, I think that's, we're all here to try to help the patient um, and, and we all have our sort of pet areas that we like to, to work on. Another question from Karina Caltibiano has asked that um, should you do a lumbar spine x-ray first when you suspect a radi uh, radiculopathy or should you go straight to an MRI? Yeah, I would... Um, if, look, if the patient's got a red, red flag um, sort of history, some of those um, past history or, or history, then yes, maybe there's value in doing the x-ray, um, but otherwise I would probably more go go to the to the MRI, because um, I think to answer the question about nerve and what's what's happening to the nerves and what's compressing it, and you're just not gonna get that information from an x-ray. The only information you'll get is whether or not there's a bony foraminal narrowing, a foraminal stenosis, but as far as is there a protrusion, is there a acid joint arthropathy causing it, is there a cyst, which level it is, I just think the MRI you get more bang for your buck for, for the one for the one test. Um. Um, you briefly mentioned leg length discrepancy. Is there actually a radiological test that can accurately measure? Will, will that help us? Yeah, that that will. Um, I think the best way to even pick the leg length is well is, is well. One way, a simple way, is just to do an erect AP pelvic X-ray without the patient wearing shoes. So that's what we do. We, we make sure the patient's not wearing shoes, just stand there erect, and then you can look at the height of the femoral head on either side to see is there a leg length discrepancy. Now, what's causing a leg length discrepancy, you need to then do a full leg length weight-bearing X-ray with an EOS machine or with We've, we've got our own um, stitching x-ray machine. We don't have an EOS machine, but we can still stitch. And we have a ruler along the side of the um, image. And, and also using PACS digitally, you can measure the length of the tibia and the femur and work out what's causing it. Also, is there any 
valgus or varus alignment at the geni valgus, geni varus at the knee as well, which may be contributing. So it can be multifactorial, but to get a, a general leg length, uh, just AP pelvic X ray will be a quick simple. That, that's done erect, has to be done erect, not super fine. Another practical question, um, the amount of radiation during a CT guided injection, you've spoken a lot about the significance yes. of going straight to MRI, but what about the uh, radiation? Yes. So the, the, dose, the dose is, is approximately two millisieverts. So we've looked back. Um, obviously the dose is dependent on how many times we scan to check where the needle position is. Um, but when, what we do is we do a, so every CT has what's called a scout image, which is basically like the CT machine actually takes a quick X ray to work out where the anatomy is, then the technologist plans we're going to scan through. But we only scan through the area where we're going to put the needle in. So we do very few scans through that area. And then when we're adjusting the needle, we only take three images through that area. Also, if you've got someone who's doing these procedures all day, every day, they're going to be much, much uh, faster or, or better at getting the needle into the position. So um, we sort of talk about if you can get the faster join in with just one shot, that's, you, you, it's like a hole in one, you've done well. So that's sort of what we're trying, trying to aim to, to do, to reduce the radiation exposure to the, to the patient. Um, obviously, you can use X-ray and fluoroscopy but the, the, the difference there is that you don't have that depth perception where, where you are. Um, and so we've moved more to doing it on CT. Plus some radiology clinics no longer have fluoroscopy. They only have a CT machine. And you've got a couple of questions asking about um, MRIs and the MBS um, politics around that. Um, do you have any insight as to whether Medicare will be changing their preferencing for us to do CTs over MRIs because of the rebate issues? Yes, um, I wish I did. I wish I did. It's a very, um, I th yeah, I don't have any insights uh, to it. Um, obviously, the uh, MRIs, I think, is just the, what is the best one test for um, sp spinal imaging and, and, and similarly for the, for the knee, for example. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very difficult... Obviously, the government is, is a bit concerned about um, expenditure and, and, and what happened when CT rolled out 30 years ago as well. And that's why they limit all these different indications. They also... Uh, different MRIs are given different um, licences. So there's what's called a full licence where specialist GPs, if the patient scan there, can get a rebate versus if there's, some sites have a partial licence some sites have no license at all and it's a lot of politics geographical areas of need um, I, I think and it's hard on GPS because often the patient doesn't want to have an out-of-pocket expense and so the, so for you guys obviously obviously it's better to send the patient for a CT the patient gets a rebate there's no out-of-pocket expense but and therefore the government thinks there's no problem because the government thinks oh well scans are being done, everyone's happy the CTs are being done, but if we look at the radiation and also maybe the, the wastage in radiology tests as well, that the patient may have a CT and then go on and have an MRI as well, um, but I, I think, yeah, like obviously the radiology college is lobbying, but maybe the GP college needs to lobby as well. I think it's good that there are some uh, MRI rebates for GPs for specific indications and hopefully that broadens and maybe in the lumbar spine it would be for radiculopathy or for myelopathy, um, not not back pain, but, but for specific indications or, or the patient has to have a, a process of a trial of conservative management before they would qualify for the MRI. Um, yeah, it's, it's very, it, there's a lot of bureaucracy and politics. Um, I've just realised, Andrew, that there's not only GPs in the audience that are watching this. We've got some allied health, we've got some chiropractors and physiotherapists as well that's asked some questions. Okay. So can physiotherapists sure. get a, a rebate? Oh, sorry, can physiotherapists refer for an MRI if the patient's happy to pay out of pocket? And yeah. the other question is, will the radiologist give a different report as to who the referring health practitioner is, whether it's a specialist GP or allied health okay. practitioner? Okay, I'll answer the second question first. No, well, for me personally, I'm going to report the report that the same regardless as to who the referrer is, because obviously, from that one test, 
the patient may go on and see lots of different health professionals, be it allied health, GP specialist, with that one scan and that one report. So I'm not going to report it differently depending on the, on the audience. Um, to I personally, the, the only the only thing I would say is maybe I may sort of suggest what the next step would be or the or the next appropriate procedure if the patient's clinic if the clinical and they're not responding to treatment to maybe because some GPs like to be guided as to what would be the next step some don't like to be guided and again it's sort of knowing your local clinician in the area having a good relationship understanding what they want um, so maybe in, in what the next step is um, some clinicians don't want written on the report what to do next um, as far as allied health yes IMED does does accept referrals from allied health um, professionals. Um, obviously, sometimes they've got a deeper knowledge of the anatomy or the pathology and the management in that area, and they work closely with GPs together as a team. Um, and they may sometimes even be suggesting to the GP, "Look, I, we've tried all this conservative. I think it's time to get imaging." So yes, and Victoria House, we do we accept allied health referrals for MRI um, as well, or, or the or the but it's also good that the allied health can say to the patient, or say to the GP and say to the patient, look, you've had an acute knee injury, you're under the age of 50, you would qualify for an MRI for an ACL tear, you just um, go to the GP and get it rather than me, the allied health professional, referring directly for the MRI of the knee, for example. Andrew, are you still happy to take further questions? Sure, sure. I think we're sure. probably close to the end of the time. Um, I said, there's another very practical question. What are the costs for these um, epidural or, or, or facet joint injections? And are they Medicare rebatable? Yes, they're definitely Medicare rebatable. Um, and the cost depends a bit on the patient's... Um, so if the patient is a, a pensioner or has a healthcare card, um, then there's a different fee. So there's a scheduled fee rather than the full fee. Um, the exact specific amounts I can't quote for you, um, but it is, yeah, I, it's maybe $200. I don't, don't quote me on those figures. And it does depend a little bit on where you are nationally. So, so um, different parts of Ironman have slightly different fee, um, fee uh, arrangements in, in place. Um, the thing is, though, because it is the radiologist's, radiologist's time to do the procedure, there is a cost associated with that. Obviously, if the radiologist was in some radiology clinics and other providers don't do any procedures, I just say, you'll have to, we'll, we'll do all the diagnostic work, but then you'll have to go to, to IMED to go have the procedure done. But at IMED, we and Victoria House, we actually do do procedures, but it's obviously some of them can be time consuming. And so we have to charge a, um, a gap for, for the time and effort. Plus, there's also the technical staff, there's the machine, there's lots of uh, costs, which you would be aware in general practice as well, running your prep your clinics as well, um, a lot of overheads. Andrew, I've got the, uh, the last two questions, which in fact I'm going to mel amalgamate into one. Um, nerve root in injections are, are done quite frequently, and in general practice, we do intra-articular joint injections ourselves often, and patients come back and request them again and again and again. And the rule of thumb, I suppose, for a lot of GPs is that we try and limit the amount of intra-articular knee injections to maybe two or three a year. What about nerve root injections? How often can we do them? And for chronic conditions, are there any side effects, long-term side effects from doing multiple cortisone injections in the spine? Yeah, I... I... Um, yeah, I tend to say to patients we'd, we'd want to wait at least three months, at least six months before we did it again. Obviously, with the natural history of these disc lesions, compressing nerves, as we've shown, that, that in the slides, they are going to decrease in time. The, the inflammation of the protrusion, the size of the protrusion will decrease, and therefore, I don't often get patients coming back for nerve root sleeve injections. It's more patients coming back for the fat joint injections. Um, as far as risks, like, like there are obviously risks of bleeding and infection with, with any procedure, um, but yeah, haven't really encountered any of that. And I do, I do a lot of, I'm doing a lot of these procedures for many years. So, um, yeah, I think the risks are very low.
Thank you very much uh, for that, Andrew. I think I'll hand back over to Angie to close the meeting. Thank you, Angie. Thank you for the very informative presentation tonight, Dr. Rotson, and thank you, Dr. Flanagan, for facilitating a really great Q&A there at the end. Um, and of course, thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. As a reminder, please stay online where you'll be re redirected shortly to complete your evaluation of tonight's presentation. Once again, thank you all. Good night.